This video is about the anatomy of the urinary system. I'll start with a discussion of the anatomy of the organs of the urinary system with a focus on the kidney and a brief discussion of their roles. The next video focuses on the physiology of the kidney. That is, how does the kidney make urine by filtering the blood? So the anatomy of the urinary system is fairly simple. It consists of the two kidneys in which blood is filtered and urine is produced. The urine travels from the kidneys through the ureters. And there are two ureters. Ureters are tubes which bring the urine to the bladder, which is essentially a storage unit. And then the urine is released outside the body through the urethra. You'll notice that the blood enters the kidney to be filtered first through the descending abdominal aorta, which then travels into the renal artery. And this travels into the kidney where the blood is filtered. The filtered blood leaves the kidney through the renal vein and enters the inferior superior vena cava where it returns back to the heart. You'll also notice that where the artery and the vein enter the kidney, there is a depression, and this is called the renal hilus. On top of the kidneys are the adrenal glands. Remember in the cat that the adrenal glands were more medial. So those are the organs of the urinary system. But the major organ is the kidney. So the kidney is the major excretory organ in the body. And its main job is to filter your blood. In fact, it filters about 200 liters of blood per day. So if we think about it, an adult has about five liters of blood. That's the total amount that a typical adult has. So if the kidneys are filtering 200 liters per day, then this means that each day, the, the entire blood volume is filtered 40 times. So again, every day your entire blood volume is filtered 40 times by the kidney. That's a tremendous amount of filtering. So why is it being filtered? Well, partly to remove toxins, metabolic waste, and ions from the blood. The other thing that the kidney does is it regulates the volume of your blood and the chemical makeup of the blood. For example, um, it maintains the proper balance between water and salts. It also maintains the balance uh, between the acids and bases. So you might, it might help you eliminate, in some cases, if your blood's too acidic, hydrogen ions. In, in, in regulating the volume of the blood and even the chemical makeup the, of the blood, the kidney also regulates your blood pressure. This is a really important role. So these are some roles, but the kidney also does things that people don't typically think of as a role of the urinary system. For example, gluconeogenesis. If you look at the word and you kind of break this word up, you can see that gluco refers to glucose, and <clears throat> neo means new, and genesis means the beginning. So gluconeogenesis is the production of glucose from its building blocks. And this is actually a role of the kidney. Um, what this means is that the kidney doesn't take polysaccharides and break them down into monosaccharides. It actually creates glucose from its building blocks or components. Another role of the kidney involves uh, Hormones. So a part of the kidney is actually endocrine tissue. And some of the endocrine tissue secretes a hormone called renin, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide. Um, the other part endocrine tissue release, releases a hormone called erythropoietin. And you might remember this from the chapter on blood. Erythropoietin is a hormone which increases the maturation of red blood cells. So essentially, it increases the number of mature red blood cells that are released. The last role of the kidney is to activate vitamin D. Now you might remember that vitamin D is made in the skin. And in order to make it, you need two ingredients, ultraviolet B plus cholesterol. 
That's how vitamin D is made. However, the, the vitamin D that's made in the skin is in an inactive form. And so it needs to travel to the kidney to become active. If you remember, one of the things that vitamin D does is it allows the absorption of calcium across your intestines. This allows the calcium to get into the blood which then can be used for one of the many functions of calcium, like building strong bones or helping in muscle contraction, helping in cardiac muscle contraction, um, helping with gland secrete and neurons release neurotransmitters. So these are some of the roles. Um, now the last role, regulate blood pressure, I just want to mention briefly one way the kidney does that because we won't have a chance to look at this again. And it's, it does it through something called the renin angiotensin system. So remember that renin is a hormone that is made by the kidney. When the blood pressure is low, certain cells in the kidney called the juxtaglomerular cells release a hormone called renin. So again, this is a hormone. Hormone and it's an also an enzyme. And this hormone and enzyme catalyzes the conversion of a large molecule called angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 travels through your blood to the lungs where it is converted to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 has a number of effects um, on different parts of the body, but its main effect overall is to increase your blood pressure. It does that in several ways. The first way is that it causes vasoconstriction of the smooth muscle of your blood vessels. And if that happens, the lumen gets smaller and the blood pressure increases. Another thing it does is it, it travels to the adrenal cortex and causes it to release the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone travels back to the kidney through the blood and increases the absorption of sodium and water. So as more water pours into the blood vessels, blood volume increases. And if blood volume goes up, remember from the blood vessel chapter, so does blood pressure. So now there are two things, uh, two ways that angiotensin II is acting to increase your blood pressure. The other way is it will travel to the thirst centers um, in the brain and cause you to drink more water and that causes an increase in blood volume, increase in blood pressure. It can also increase the amount of antidiuretic hormone which causes your blood volume to go up. So remember antidiuretic hormone decreases the amount of water released in the urine and that water is kept in the blood. So blood volume goes up, blood pressure goes up. Again, there are three ways, at least these are actually four ways, that angiotensin II works to increase your blood pressure. So it is a very, very powerful um, cause of blood pressure increase. Let's now compare the anatomy of the urinary system between the male and the female. So if we take a look at the male anatomy, this is a, a a lateral view after a sagittal section. Um, let's just get the lay of the land here. You can see that we have the rectum back here in the anus, so parts of the digestive system are here. Um, and then you'll see here the bladder. So imagine that up in this area is the kidney. As the kidney produces urine, it travels down through the ureter, here's the left ureter, into the bladder. And from the bladder, it travels out through the urethra. So that's the, the male anatomy. If we take a look more towards the female, again, you'll notice the rectum and the anus. And then you'll also notice uh, the uterus, which is part of the female reproductive system, along with the vagina. And then under that, you can see the bladder. So imagine again that the kidney is up here somewhere and it produces a urine that travels down through the right ureter behind the uterus and enters the bladder. From the bladder, the urine is going to exit through the urethra. So in the female, there are actually one, two, three openings. 
And you can see why as a woman becomes pregnant and the uterus goes from the size of a grapefruit to the size of a basketball, you can see how it's going to be pressing on the bladder. And that's why a lot of pregnant women um, have to urinate a lot because the bladder is already compressed so it can't hold the same amount of volume that it normally does. Um, but another difference between the male and the female and that between besides the fact that the female has three openings and the male has just two the rectum and the urethra is the length of the urethra. So you'll notice in the male the urethra is much longer and the female it's fairly short. And because of that, females are much more susceptible to urinary tract infections, infections of the urethra and even into the bladder. Um, you'll notice that, um, that, the, that the anus is not too far from the opening of the urethra. So what happens sometimes is that the bacteria that comes out of the um, rectum kind of gets spread on the surface and it can get swept into the urethra um, during sexual intercourse or if there's, there's wiping from front to back. Um, in fact, 40% uh, of most women will get a urinary tract infection in their lifetime. For a male, on the other hand, it's not so easy. In fact, it's very difficult for the bacteria maybe on the surface here to travel all the way to here. So it's much, much less likely. Now let's take a look at the bladder. Take a look at a bla the bladder here. This is actually um, an a, uh, anterior view of the bladder. And you can see here's a ureter, here's another ureter. So the ureters um, empty into the bladder posteriorly. Um, and you'll notice on the inside of the bladder are these wave-like structures called rugae. And you'll remember that rugae are found in the empty stomach. They're wave-like um, formations of the mucosa. They're also found um, on the roof of the mouth. And rugae just really means wave-like. So when the bladder is empty, you get these wave-like structures that serve to increase the surface area. Um, here's the urethra. This happens to be a male because <clears throat> there's a prostate gland, which is only found in the male. And there are two sphincters, which are generally smooth muscle. One is called the internal urethral sphincter, which tightens and closes <clears throat> the, um, the opening to the outside. And then you have another one called the external urethral sphincter, and this is actually skeletal muscle. So just like in the digestive system, the release of the internal urethral sphincter is actually um, involuntary, but the release of the external is voluntary because it's skeletal muscle. And so even though you do not have control over contracting the bladder to force the urine out, because remember the bladder is made of smooth muscle, you do have control of the sphincter that releases the urine. All right, so we've, we've gone over some gen general structure of the urinary system. And before we move on uh, to the kidney, which is the main organ of the urinary system, it's probably worth taking a look at the adrenal glands, which actually sit on top of the kidney. Now the adrenal glands consist of two glands, actually. The outer region is called the cortex. So the outer region of, of all organs is called the cortex. And this is the part that is actually the endocrine gland. The inner region is called the medulla. And this is actually not an endocrine gland. It is actually made of nervous tissue, uh, modified sympathetic neurons. And these secrete catecholamines um, that you know called epinephrine and norepinephrine. So again, this is not an endocrine gland. And these are generally secreted in response to the fight or flight mechanism. Okay, so I'm just going to mention that there, just as a reminder, we've covered this. But let's go back to the cortex, which secretes, uh, which is an endocrine gland and secretes hormones, because it is related to the function of the urinary system. There are three families of hormones um, that are released, but before we get into that, what causes the adrenal cortex, which is an endocrine gland, to secrete its hormones? Well, it's another hormone secreted by the anterior pituitary and this is called adrenocorticotrophic hormone. 
So we've already talked about this. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, is, uh, re oops, is released by the anterior pituitary. released by the anterior pituitary, it travels through the blood to the adrenal cortex and causes it to release um, a number of hormones called corticosteroids. So you can tell just by the name that these are steroid hormones. And there are three families of steroid hormones, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and gonadocorticoids. So let's take a look at these, these hormones. And we'll start with mineralocorticoids. Well, in general, there are many mineralocorticoids. There's, an, there's not just one. And what they tend to do, do is regulate the electrolyte concentration of extracellular fluids. So remember um, that what electrolytes are, are soluble chemicals whose ions conduct electrical currents into solutions, okay? So electrolytes, again, sorry about that. An electrolyte, again, is a soluble chemical whose ions conduct electrical currents in solution. So these hormones regulate the concentration of these ions outside of the cell. And of course, all cells are bathed in fluid. The main electrolytes that are regulated are sodium and potassium. And so there are many uh, mineralocorticoids, but probably the most important one in terms of what we're talking about is called aldosterone. And you'll remember, we've already discussed this, but what aldosterone does is it stimulates reabsor reabsorption of sodium from the kidney back to the blood. So remember, the kidney is filtering your blood. It is removing harmful substances and ions. So sodium gets filtered out of your blood into the kidney and would, re would leave your body as urine, except that aldosterone causes sodium to move from the kidney back into the blood. So, so essentially what aldosterone is doing is maintaining the sodium balance in your body, maintaining it. It reduces the amount of sodium you lose. Think of your body as the great recycler. It's not going to release anything in your urine that you could use. And sodium is probably the single most important ion in your body. Single most important. Um, the term down here, by the way, cation, sorry, cation here means a positively charged ion. So this is one of the most important ones in your body. Um, it determines the amount of sodium that you have, determines the volume of the extracellular fluid. It also is closely tied in to the volume of your blood. So this is really important. It also regulates the concentration of other ions, like bicarbonate ion, or potassium, or hydrogen. Okay, so essentially aldosterone is maintaining the balance of sodium in your body. And it is a mineralocorticoid released by the adrenal cortex. Another family of, of hormones, steroid hormones, released by the adrenal cortex are called glucocorticoids. And probably the most important one for our purposes is called cortisol. Now you've probably heard of different types uh, of hormones, cortisol, cortisone, corticosterone, sorry, corticosterone. Uh, the, most, the one that is released in the largest amount in humans is cortisol. Cortisol helps you resist stress, both physical and mental. So keep in mind here that physical or mental stress, it doesn't matter, your body doesn't know the difference, is going to stimulate the fight or flight response. Your body doesn't know the difference between physical or mental stress. So think back to the early days of the caveman when he was being um, chased by the saber-toothed tiger, for example. The fight-or-flight response causes things to happen in your body that help you either successfully flee 
or successfully stay and fight. It's going to help you survive. And so whether it is a true physical stress, and, and such as running for the bus, or, um, or whether it's mental stress, such as worrying about an exam, the fight or flight still kicks in. And what cortisol does is help you um, fight against that stress. So the way it does that is by mobilizing fuel for energy production. And of course, the main source of energy in our body is ATP. So its job is to make sure there are enough ingredients to produce ATP. It also helps to keep blood glucose levels constant. So what exactly does it do it? Well, how exactly does it do this? Um, well, it promotes gluconeogenesis, first of all. Remember, we talked about this before, gluconeogenesis is the formation of glucose from um, non-carbohydrates. And this occurs in the kidney, it also occurs in the liver. So that's one way to make glucose. Another thing it does is it increases the glucose level in your blood, the fatty acids in your blood, and the amino acids. Remember that fatty acids can also enter the Krebs cycle to help make ADP, ATP. It saves glucose for the brain. That means it keeps the glucose levels constant so that the brain will always have a source of glucose. Um, and, and this is one of the main roles of cortisol. So you might might postulate then that high cortisol levels are associated with high levels of sugar in the blood, and you would be correct. Some newer studies have shown that people who are under constant stress are at elevated risk of type 2 diabetes. So there seems to be a, a connection now between constant stress, stress, which is the way you feel, and um, and insulin, uh, sorry, and diabetes. The other thing that glucocorticoids does is they help maintain blood volume um, and also thus blood pressure, preventing water shift into the tissues and preventing someone from going into shock. They also decrease the immune and inflammatory responses. In fact, with too much cortisol, you can have significantly anti-inflammatory and anti-immune effects, which means you're more susceptible to disease. Cortisol also decreases cartilage formation in bones. The last group of steroid hormones produced by the adrenal cortex are called gonadocorticoids. And these are produced in very small amounts. Um, these are very weak androgens, which can be converted to the more potent testosterone or small amounts of estrogen. So when people finally figured out that the adrenal cortex actually could make testosterone and estrogen, they were confused because they said, well, the, the ovaries make estrogen in a female and the testes make testosterone in a male. Of course, males also produce small amounts of estrogen and females produce small amounts of testosterone. So what was the purpose of the adrenal cortex making them? Well, the amounts of testosterone and estrogen produced by the adrenal cortex is very small compared to the amount produced by the testes and ovaries. And so they, the, the hypothesis now is that these particular um, testosterone and estrogen hormones are helping to initiate puberty. So it begins puberty. It also seems to be related to the growth of axillary and pubic hair. And in women, it is related to sex drive and also production of estrogens after menopause. Because of course, after menopause, the ovaries no longer produce estrogen, but there are small amounts of estrogen in the female. Um, estrogen, by the way, is also produced by fat. Okay, now that we've covered the overall anatomy of the urinary system and looked closely at the function of the adrenal glands which sit on top of the kidneys and are related to the function. Let's take a closer look at the major organ of the urinary system which is the kidney. This picture shows you a uh, transverse section of the body cavity and you can see anterior here, posterior here you'll notice that the peritoneal cavity uh, 
in the center has been has had the organs removed so the digestive organs are re removed and here of course is the peritoneal uh, which is a, a membrane a serous membrane and it's very clear from this that the kidneys are retroperitoneal now remember that retroperitoneal means outside the peritoneum retroperitoneal outside the peritoneum in this case they are outside or underneath the peritoneum each kidney weighs around five ounces and it is about six inches long and about two and a half inches wide so each kidney you can think of this is probably the size of a large bar, bar of soap So think about the giant soap bars that you, you can find in, in some specialty stores, not the typical, typical size that you find uh, in supermarkets. Again, about, about six inches long, about two and a half inches wide. Each kidney is surrounded by three layers. And the first layer that surrounds the kidney is called the fibrous capsule. And this clings to the surface of the kidney like plastic wrap. So think about a clear plastic wrap surrounding a kidney, and that's kind of what the fibrous capsule is like. Some people call it the renal capsule. And the role of the renal capsule is actually to protect the kidney from infection. Okay, so that's the um, the most superficial layer and then even more superficial or further from the surface of the kidney is the fat capsule and you can see it right here they also call it the, the fat capsule it surrounds the yellow material and of course the purpose of fat is to cushion and protect and that's exactly what it does here you'll find this for that a lot of organs in the body they are surrounded by fat um, at the end of Anatomy and Physiology 2, 1, you might have dissected the cow eye or the sheep eye, and it was packed in a solid layer of fat to protect the eye. Um, when you did the uh, dissection of the kidneys in the cat, you would find that they are packed in fat. So this layer is very obvious. And then most superficially is the renal capsule, or in this case they're calling it the renal fascia. That's the most superficial layer. And what this does is it anchors the kidney to the posterior body wall. Remember, the kidneys are kind of suspended in your body, and they need to be anchored by something. Um, this particular type of tissue is, is dense, regular connective tissue, and you might have guessed this so that the renal capsule is dense, regular connective tissue. Lots of collagen. Okay, so let's continue to look at the anatomy of the kidney. And here's a picture on the, on the left. You can see actually a, a real human kidney. And on the right is a drawing. So if you look at the kidney, you'll notice there are three distinct regions, three distinct regions. One area is called the renal cortex, and that's this lighter, light outer region here. Remember, cortex means the outside, but you can see it's kind of light here, renal cortex. And you can see it here on the drawing as well. And then you'll see that there is an inner region called the renal medulla. So this inner region, which is a little darker, this is called the medulla, right there. And you can see it on the drawing here. And then lastly, there is extensions, there are extensions of the cortex, it's probably easier to see here, where the cortex extends into the medulla, into the, in the middle of the kidney, see, into. These are actually called renal columns, renal columns. So that's where the external cortex extends into the medulla. And the purpose of that is to uh, provide a route for blood vessels and nerves um, to the tissue in the, in the center of the kidney. Okay, so those are the three regions. Now, some other structures you'll notice is besides the cortex, um, 
which is fairly light. In the inner region, you have these things called renal pyramids. And they look kind of like a triangle here. Okay, now this, where it says renal medulla, it's just referring to the whole middle part of the kidney. But the renal pyramid here, the pyramid are just these kind of triangular, darker structures. They're also called medullary pyramids because they're in the medulla. Some other structures here, uh, remember, so what's happening, let's probably do it this way, is out in the cortex where, is where you have a lot of um, your blood being filtered for the most part. So most of the blood is filtered out here and then it is going to travel through ducts in the uh, renal pyramids into this area. So this area here is actually called a minor calyx. So you can see it's written right here. It's this part right here. So here's a minor calyx. Here's a minor calyx. Here's one. Here's one. These are all minor calyxes calyces. And a, a calyx is actually um, a funnel or an opening. So the urine, which is the, the being produced here, once the blood is filtered and it passes through these ducts, um, it's going to enter the minor calyx. From the minor calyx, it's going to flow into the major calyx. So you'll see major calyx. Uh, a major calyx is just where you have two or more minors dumping. So anytime you see here, we've got one, two, three minor calyces dumping into a larger major. Likewise, these two minor dump into a larger major. And then from the major calyx, all of the major calyces dump into this large open area, which is called the renal pelvis. From the renal pelvis, it's going to flow out through the ureter. So now we're beginning to get a little bit more information about the pathway of urine than just kidney, ureter, bladder, urethra outside the body. Okay, so let's keep that in mind as we look at the next picture. So again, um, the kidney filters the blood. That's one of its main roles. And if we took all the blood vessels away from the kidney, it would look kind of like this. And I think this shows you a little bit more, it's probably a better idea of the flow because you can actually see these indentations here, which the formed urine is going to flow through. Now, I did say most of the, your, the blood is filtered in the cortex, and this is showing you the renal cortex. Um, we'll get into a little more detail. Sometimes some of, some of it is filtered also a little deeper, but it's filtered by something called a nephron. And just going to introduce this term here, nephron is, uh, are the filtering units of the kidney. So blood is filtered here, it travels through a series of tubes and enters into the collecting ducts. So here's one collecting duct. Collecting ducts can be seen in this picture as these straight lines. So all these lines that you're seeing that are running through the renal pyramid are actually collecting ducts. And from the collecting ducts, they flow into the minor calyx, then the major calyx, then the renal pelvis. Here's another view of that, and again, you can see out here, it doesn't show you the nephrons, but this is where the blood's being filtered. So from here, the blood flows into the collecting ducts, which look like striations here. And from the collecting duct, the blood again flows into the minor calyx, minor meaning it's smaller. And from the minor calyx here, these all flow into a major calyx. And from these major calyces, there's one, two, three, they all flow into the renal pelvis. And from the renal pelvis, it's going to flow into the ureter. Now remember from the ureter, it's going to travel to the bladder and from the bladder to the urethra and then outside the body. So this is the pathway of urine. You should be familiar with this. If you can remember the anatomy of the kidney in your head, it's probably easy, fairly easy to, to trace the flow, flow of urine.